Hello and welcome to Good Game Well Played. My name is Hingers and we are back for 2016, Season 2, Episode 1. That's SO2 EO1 if you're torrenting this. And might I add, we are still the ABC's only show about competitive video games and the nerds who play them. Gaze upon my kingdom! Today, I shall solve match fixing in esports off the back of another StarCraft pro being arrested. But first, let's take a look at the news. First up, let's start with CSGO lineup news and Havoc, aka The Beard, real name Luke Payton, has been dropped by Team Renegades. This follows on from a poor run of form from the team of Australians based in Los Angeles as Renegades missed out on a place at IEM Katowice after finishing second at the CSGO Asia Regional Minor, which was won by the Mongols. Havoc has been replaced by fellow Australian Ustalo, real name Carlo Pivic from Team Immunity, and at the time of recording it has not been confirmed where Havoc will be headed next. Staying with Renegades, but moving to their League of Legends team, Remy, real name Maria Krebling, has stepped down from her role as support in the starting lineup of their LCS team. Remy joined the newly formed Renegades in June 2015 and played through the North American Challenger series last year. In a statement, she said, The past few weeks have been really tough for me as I've continued to struggle with a lot of personal issues, most notably anxiety and self-esteem issues. These were amplified by playing on stage and the rigorous day-to-day -day of being a pro player, compounded with a lot of the stress. Kravling, who was the first woman to play in LCS, has not fully retired from League and will continue to work with the team. In 61 minutes, Renegades 1-0! And finally, in rap slash esports crossover news, Lupe Fiasco just beat Dago in a Street Fighter V exhibition match. Please activate him, will he throw some lightning at him? Don't be- Oh, oh man! He got an uppercut! That's three, you win, Lupe! Dago needs you to won. get on that You're return the ticket! You're the best, a Lupe! A return ticket! Dago, also known as The Beast, is one of the most successful and famous fighting game competitors of all time and took on Lupe in front of 75,000 people who are watching it on stream, losing 3-2. If you ask me, it seems a bit like Dago was being gracious and probably holding back a bit so as not to humiliate Lupe. But as Mr. Fiasco immediately announced his retirement from competitive fighting games after he won, I guess we'll never get a rematch. Alright, that's it for the news. Let's now travel to the seedy underworld of StarCraft II match fixing. So, at the end of last month, South Korean pro gamer Life, real name Lee Seung Hyun, was arrested by Korean prosecutors on allegations of match fixing. This follows on from arrests of Korean pros Yoda, Babung Babung, and Gerard last year, who received lifetime bans from competitive StarCraft by KESPA, the Korean Esports Association. They are currently awaiting trial in Korean courts. I'm gonna be honest, this was pretty devastating for me, right? I'm a huge fan of StarCraft. I was also a huge fan of Life. He played this exciting and unpredictable style and was also just wildly successful. Fans of StarCraft will know Life was the youngest ever GSL champion, winning the Code S Season 4 final in 2012 when he was only 15 years old. He was also a StarCraft II Royal Rota, that is someone who wins a tournament on their debut qualification. Now, it should be said, obviously, he hasn't gone to trial or been found guilty yet, so we can't talk really about his case specifically, but it does bring up the issue of match fixing in esports, so let's talk about that. I think we can all agree it's just the worst, right? Competitive gaming is a way for us to work out who is the best. It's not perfect, but the idea of tournament play is you put the best people into an arena and then the matches are a way for us to approximate and settle who is the best at StarCraft. So the idea of someone not trying their best at the game we love or throwing a match or being influenced or corrupted by outside money, the idea of someone doing anything but playing to their best and trying to win hurts us as fans and we take it so personally. How could they care so little for our feelings? But how does match fixing actually work? Let's just play this out as an example, right? Let's say this uh, Chun-Li figurine is a StarCraft 2 pro and she's facing off against a uh, Ken. Sure, in a professional match, let's say it's like a GSL Code A round of 32 or something, whatever, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, there's a couple of ways this, this can play out, but at its core, it's always gambling, right? Match fixing is only profitable to the extent that you can manipulate betting markets. So let's say Chun-Li is the favorite and bookmakers, is, in this instance, let's say that's Timo, have put the odds at $1.20 for Chun-Li and $3.20 for Ken. Now I assume you're all wholesome individuals who don't understand the vice of gambling at all, but just to be clear, that means if I bet a dollar on Chun-Li and she wins, I'll get a dollar twenty back. And similarly, if I bet a dollar on Ken and he wins, I'll get $3.20 back. 
The match fixing, it works like this. A villainous gangster, for example, uh, Scorpion, approaches Chun-Li and says, I will pay you X amount of money to lose to Ken, right? And Chun-Li's like, oh, sure, I could use the cash, right? Then, confident on the, what the result will be, Scorpion goes to his cronies, uh, the Wonder Woman and Batman, and says, look, we can more than triple our money if we bet on Ken, who we know is going to win because we paid off Chun-Li. And it doesn't have to be as blatant as throwing a match, right? It could simply be that Chun-Li tells Scorpion, or one of Scorpion's associates, what Build Order she's gonna try and do on a certain map. Wink, wink. Like Chun-Li might try and do a six pool or I guess a 12 pool, right? And, and now Ken, if he knows that in advance, it makes defending that much easier. And to anyone watching, it just looks like Ken guessed correctly or quote, won the mind game. But in reality, he knew the whole time. So then Scorpion, the villainous gangster, goes back to the bookmakers, that is Timo, and bets tens of thousands of dollars or however much, and I guess it would probably wouldn't be dollars, it'd be South Korean won in this instance, because it's in Korea. Anyway, Scorpion places a bunch of bets that Ken will win. Then old mate Scorpo goes back and just sits and waits to collect his sweet cash money dollars. Now for this to work, the money that Scorpion is offering Chun-Li is presumably greater than the prize money being offered to Chun-Li for winning that match. That's what the incentive is, right? And also, the profits that Scorpion is making from winning the bet with Timo will have to be more than what he's paying Chun-Li. But the way bookmakers operate, that is Timo, if they sense there's movement in the betting market, they will adjust their odds. So if lots of people are betting that Ken is gonna win the fight, Timo might reduce the odds from $3.20 down to $2.50 or $1.90 or something, which makes each successive bet that Scorpion places less and less profitable. So that means that Scorpion needs to bet a lot of money last minute so that the bookmakers, that is Timo, doesn't have time to adjust his odds. Often, when we see the betting market disproportionately flooded with money last minute, people, that is fans, players, tournament organizers, we get suspicious. And at that point, bookmakers, that is Timo for example, will often suspend betting on particular matches if they suspect something dodgy might be happening. And then Scorpion, uh, this guy, can't get that sweet cash money anymore because he can't place any more bets. So in order to prevent that, bookmakers need to find matches where there is a lot of money trading hands so that it's harder to detect suspicious betting patterns. They can hide their bets in amongst the slew of other bets that are happening, which is why even though a lot of suspicious betting activity has been seen in low league SC2 matches, it can be harder to detect in more high profile matches like WCS World Finals or that kind of thing. Also, I guess Scorpion has to make sure that uh, Ken is good enough to actually beat Chun-Li even if she's trying to throw the match. But who knows, I mean, he could just be terrible. Chun-Li could be trying to throw the match and, and Ken is just like a real scrub and he's, you know, it's impractical, he can't even. And I guess you've also got to make sure that nobody has paid Ken to try and throw the match either. Then you just get two people trying to lose and it'd be disastrous chaos. That's the how, but the question is, what can the industry do about it? What can the industry do to prevent match fixing? One of the problems is, because of the global nature of gambling in the game, match fixing is not a specific criminal violation everywhere. Obviously it is in Korea, but it will be impossible to control until at the very least it is universally criminalized. We also need to think about incentives. People have made the argument that if we paid esports pros more, match fixing would be eradicated. And maybe it would be, or maybe it'd be lessened, but you've got to remember life, who just got done, is one of the most successful StarCraft II plays of all time. And if he allegedly found himself in a situation where it made sense to fix a match, basically anyone is at risk. So here are my thoughts on how to end match fixing in StarCraft. You take a cut, say 15% from all money placed on every match from betting syndicates, right? And you put that aside, and that's prize money for each match, winner takes all, for every match that he's bet on. Right, that means that if Scorpion wants to give Chun-Li a financial incentive to throw a match, he needs to offer her a guarantee of money that is more than is in this secret money pile over here. Okay, but then just say Scorpion is like Bill Gates and has like a bajillion dollars, right? Maybe he can then afford to drop that kind of heavy money on a WCS final or whatever. So then you scale betting limits, right? And as the match draws closer and closer, you limit the size of the bets people can place on the matches. So maybe you can bet whatever you want a week out, but then the day before you can only bet, you know, X amount of dollars. And that decreases the closer you get to the match. This prevents huge last minute money flooding the market and lessens the financial incentive for betting syndicates. And yes, this eats into bookmakers' profits, but gambling isn't integral to esports. And to be honest, for years now, these bookmakers have been making a bunch ton of cash on esports, and very few of them are reinvesting in the industry. You can even take a cut from the allocated prize money and put it into, you know, developing other anti-corruption and anti-match fixing practices. But wouldn't this ruin gambling? Maybe. I mean, I don't think so, but on some level, like, who cares, right? Like if gambling's ruined, it doesn't really matter. If you need to bet money on something in order to feel alive, that's on you. 
Levying a proportional tax on StarCraft 2 gambling would just mean bookmakers would have to factor that into their odds, which they already do for other fees and regulations. Oh, but Hingers, how could you ever implement such a system? That's a dumb question and you're an idiot. Many governments around the world already have specific tax brackets for legalized gambling. So it will be simply a matter of extending and specifying those laws. All right. Have I solved match fixing? Definitely. Let me know, but you'll agree with me because I'm right. Frankly, it's a very practical and easily implemented solution, and you can get in touch via social media, or as always, you can try and guess my email address. Here's a hint, it's at the ABC. You can also let us know what you want to see on the show, and be sure to tune in next week when I'll be chatting to a Street Fighter V pro about the release of the new Street Fighter. Until then, hang us out. See ya!